Okay, I think we are live now. Yeah. And good afternoon. Afternoon here in Oxford. Uh, welcome to Primate Conversations. Okay, I think we are live now. Okay, I think we are. I've turned off the echo that uh, usually comes up after I do this brief introduction. Good afternoon. Afternoon here in Oxford. Uh, welcome to Primate Conversations. Uh, it's back again. Uh, right now. I think we are. I've turned off the echo that uh, usually comes up after I do this brief introduction. Good afternoon. Afternoon here in Oxford. Uh, welcome to Primate Conversations. Sorry again, there's a uh, Okay. Okay, back again to the introduction. I was just turning off uh, uh, it's windows that pop up. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, uh, Professor Lars Wordelin uh, with us uh, in Primate Conversations today. Uh, my name is uh, Rene Bobe. And uh, Lars uh, is a professor of paleobiology at the Swedish Museum of Natural History. He earned his PhD in geology and paleontology from uh, Stockholm University in uh, 1981, if I may say, Lars. And since that time, I guess it's been now uh, uh, a few decades since 1981, since that time, uh, uh, Lars has been publishing uh, extensively uh, mostly, but not only, uh, on the evolution of uh, the order carnivora, uh, including topics uh, on taxonomy, uh, descriptions of new species, as well as theoretical issues dealing with phylogeny, biogeography, diversification, and turnover, mostly during the Cenozoic. Uh, the geographic scope of uh, Lars' work uh, encompasses most continents. I've seen some of his work dealing with um, uh, faunas from uh, certainly Europe, uh, quite a lot, uh, and Asia, as well as Africa and the Americas. I don't know if I'm leaving behind Australia. But you are leaving behind Australia. And Australia as well. How about Antarctica? Nope. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, so extend, uh, publishing extensively with, with uh, uh, quite a bit of a scope, in, both in, in temporal and geographic terms. Uh, Lars has co-edited several volumes in addition to his scientific papers, including the, the highly influential Cenozoic Mammals of Africa, uh, which is, I have to uh, gather my strength to just to pick it up, uh, a wonderful volume that uh, it's, a, it's a very fundamental tool for those of us who continue to work on African faunas. It's a, a key reference and it has been now published uh, for 10 years and uh, it's one of the key works that we refer to in furthering the work on the evolution of African, African mammals. Uh, today we will hear about a, a very particular topic, a special topic uh, uh, about the possible relationship between hominin evolution and the diversity of Pleiopleistocene carnivora uh, in Africa. So Lars, welcome. Uh, we're very happy to have you here and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody uh, whom I can't see. Uh, just hope you're out there. Um, so yes, I will be talking about uh, hominin carnivore relationships in uh, slightly different terms from sort of from the perspective of a, uh, of a mammalogist and, uh, and uh, carnivore specialist. So first of all, I will uh, try to share my screen so that you can uh, Follow along, and um, I hope you can see the screen. If you can't, uh, people will have to shout. So um, I will be talking about uh, if hominins impacted carnivore diversity in the African pie Pleistocene, and um, there will be topics on diversity, disparity, and competition, and uh, comparisons between. Um, the past and the situation today. Um, so the, hmm, there we go. Now things are working better. 
So the outline of the talk, I'll, um, since I can't assume that everybody is uh, completely familiar with African carnivores, uh, I'll give you a brief introduction to um, the fossil record, uh, particularly of the Plague Pleistocene, and some specifics about the major uh, families of carnivores that are present in Africa uh, during uh, the past 5 million years. Then I'll talk about diversity and disparity patterns and uh, the evolution of the carnivore, large carnivore guild in particular uh, in the Pleistocene. And uh, finally talk about uh, competition within the large carnivore guild uh, in the early Pleistocene and now and um, make some general conclusions and, and, and discussions and uh, hope you follow along. So the Pleistocene fossil record of, of uh, carnivora. So these are data from um, Cenozoic mammals of Africa, which Rene so kindly introduced and uh, used as a uh, barbell uh, or dumbbell. Um, so these data are about 10 years old. There has been some addition, uh, a couple of genera and a number of species, et cetera, so, so, but not much. So um, there are eight families of carnivores present in the Pleistocene of Africa fossil record. Um, Canidae dogs with a total of six genera, all of which are known from the, from the Pleistocene. Um, canids are, uh, appear in the late Miocene. Ursids, there are no bears in Africa today, but there were bears in the past, uh, four genera and one, one genus in the Pleistocene. Mustelids, which are a particularly interesting group, uh, are known from a total of 20 genera in, in the fossil record of Africa, five of which are present in the Black Pleistocene. Uh, Nandinia, a very special case, is known from one questionable record in the uh, Miocene. It's not known as a fossil in the Black Pleistocene, but of course, this is a living species, the palm civet. Um, the civets, the Verity, uh, known from 15 genera, three of which are present uh, in the Plague Pleistocene. Herpestids, mongooses, uh, also a, a species rich group, and uh, known from eight genera in the Plague Pleistocene. Hyenas, uh, surprisingly late entrants, uh, but are known from uh, six genera in the Plague Pleistocene. And then, of course, Felidae, which you know is the, is the family that we all think of when we think of, of carnivores, I think, uh, the, them and the hyenas. Uh, and they're known from 10 genera in the Pleistocene and a few additional ones in the Miocene. So it's a, it is a rich record. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of things you could say about the, uh, the carnivores of the Miocene. In fact, they're, you know, in the Miocene, there's an entirely different order of, of carnivores, uh, the hyenodonts in Africa that uh, are very interesting uh, and competed with uh, the order carnivora, but we'll stick to the Plague Pleistocene in this talk. So canids, the dogs, are a North American group and they evolved in the Eocene of North, in, uh, of, uh, North America um, and are very late in appearing in um, Eurasia in the old world. Um, and the earliest record in the old world, curiously enough, is from Spain. So as far away in Eurasia as you can get from the source area in North America. Um, that record is from the Miocene, it's less than eight and a half million years old, is from a site that's not particularly well dated. But there are other, there are other canid records in, uh, in Eurasia, in, in the late Miocene, as well as in Africa, uh, where uh, a single species of vulpes, foxes, it's known from Taurus Manala and Chad, which of course is the, uh, the origin of Sahelanthropus as well. And, and Taurus Manala is dated about 7 million. So uh, uh, once canids got into Eurasia, they were spread very rapidly. Uh, we don't exactly know how they spread, but... Uh, but although they did spread rapidly, they didn't diversify particularly quickly. So the first record of multiple cane attacks in a single locality in Africa is from uh, Latoli uh, at 4 million approximately. So there, there's, there are multiple uh, dog attacks there. Um, 
two of the fossil tax genera in Africa are extinct. Uh, Eucyon, which is a, uh, an ancestral genus to Canis and is globally extinct. And Nycteroides, the raccoon dogs, which are uh, extinct in Africa, but are known from, are, are living in Eurasia. Mustelids, like I said, mustelids are a very special case. Uh, small mustelids are very common in the Paleoarctic. Um, you know, we have lots of spe species of weasels and martens and, and uh, fishers and, uh, and, and otters and all sorts of things uh, in the Paleoarctic and in, in the Nearctic as well. Um, but they are un uncommon in Africa after the early Miocene. There are three, there are a couple of species of, uh, of ectonics um, and a couple of species of otters uh, today, but, uh, but they're, they're, they're just a fraction of the record from um, the Miocene. But um, there are a number of large hypercarnivorous mustelids known from terrestrial habitats from the middle and late Miocene of Africa. And uh, here are just five genera of, of these uh, mustelids. Uh, and uh, of particular interest is a chorus from, uh, from uh, Lothagum, uh, from the late Miocene, which is the most hypercarnivorous, the most cursorial uh, of all uh, mustelids known. Uh, it's in many respects convergent on uh, leopards. Uh, there, were, there were no leopards at the time, so there was a niche for leopard-like carnivores. Um, however, in Africa, Lutrines, otters, are the most common mustelids um, in the Plyocene. They're, they're dominated by the extinct um, tribe Enhydridontini, um, which is diverse in the, in the late Miocene and through the Pliocene, uh, with the last forms uh, from the late Pliocene and early Pleistocene uh, among the largest carnivores that ever lived. Not not as large as the largest um, bears, but certainly uh, in excess of 500 kilogram, uh, 500 pounds. Uh, so the size of a very, very large male lion. And if you look at this, uh, this illustration on the left here, um, this, uh, the figure in A is a uh, composite cranium of an hydrodon dikike. So the, the, the facial cranium here is, is from Dikika and uh, the, the uh, posterior half or the posterior part uh, where it is white uh, and going back is from Canapoy. So from two different localities from two different, different times, but they appear to be the same species. And, uh, and although the, uh, the Canapoy specimen was a little smaller, I've, I've tweaked that a bit to put this together. So for, for comparison, you should note that uh, B ha has the common European river otter uh, cranium and the shaded part is missing from the upper cranium. So, you know, there was a fair bit uh, missing there, and it gives you sort of an, an idea of, of the size of these animals, uh, which had limbs that were longer than lion limbs uh, there. We know that they existed. We don't really know what they did. We don't know what they ate, although we're working on it, but they're fascinating animals. And uh, the, the really the last word in short faces. Um, hyenas. Uh, along with Felids, the major carnivore, uh, typical carnivore uh, family. They actually reach Africa later than the other major families and appear in the, uh, the earliest, um, or the, the first half of the later part of the Middle Miocene, let's put it that way, about 13.5 million years. Um, there's a... Uh, there's a, a change in faunas around this time and some new fauna, some new tax up here and Hainity was one of them. Um, but hyenas in Africa are rare until the late Miocene and there were no bone cracking Hainity of, of the modern type south of the Sahara until the Pliocene. There is, there is a bone cracking hyena from Sahabi in Libya, um, but uh, North Africa then and North Africa today are 
at least partially, if not completely, part of uh, part of the uh, European biome. So uh, there, it's probably easier for these hyenas to get to Libya than it was to cross the Sahara or the Proto-Sahara. Um, the extant hyenidae, all four four species uh, in four genera, uh, the three large uh, bone cracking forms: spotted, striped, and brown, as well as the uh, ardwolf. Uh, Proteles, uh, termite eater, all have African origin. So this really is an African group today. Um, and interestingly, uh, all of these taxa seem to have adapted to the opening of landscapes in the Pleistocene uh, in parallel. Uh, we can go back and look at ancestral forms of, of several of them and find that they have short metacarpals and then uh, then a million years later, they all have long metacarpals adapted for uh, cursorial pursuit uh, or for, for, for um, um, long treks in uh, open habitats. Felids uh, were present in the early Miocene, uh, but are really rare until the late Miocene and are overall, are uh, until very recently, on you know, the last one and a half million years, dominated by saber tooth forms, uh, of which homotherium you can see on the left is one. Uh, so the fel feline, uh, the subfamily that includes all recent, uh, all living felids, is rare until Pleistocene. Uh, they're present in sites like Latoli and, and uh, the lower uh, members of the Kubifora formation, uh, but very rare and uh, don't really appear in their modern form until in about 2 million years ago, so in well into the Pleistocene. Now, saber tooths go extinct in Africa earlier than in other continents. In, in, in North America, of course, uh, saber tooths um, go on until the end of the, uh, the Pleistocene. Uh, and in South America, there are, there are dates that indicate that saber tooths may have survived into the Holocene. Not much, but into the Holocene. Um, but in, and in Europe, uh, saber tooths it's the, it's a debatable point, but I would argue that they probably went extinct around 300,000 years ago. So, uh, whereas in, in Africa, the last saber tooth um, went extinct about a million years ago. So that's much earlier. But saber tooths are, on the other hand, more diverse in Africa than they are on any other continent. So uh, that's an interesting. One of the interesting things about the evolution of the African carnivore fauna is, is the, uh, the abundance of saber tooths and then the extinction of the group. And uh, that is part of the motivation for uh, looking at extinction patterns. So um, we'll look at uh, carnivore species richness in the Ply Pleistocene. Um, this is a paper that I wrote with Margaret Lewis in 2005. So parts of this are a little bit obsolete, but uh, we have not done uh, a reanalysis of, of this data. The, the, the data themselves are, uh, are almost certainly okay. I mean, they're, but, but uh, the methodology needs to, needs to be updated to modern standards too. Uh, but in any case, what you, can, what you can clearly see is that uh, the peak species ri uh, richness, and this is all carnivores, small and large. So uh, peak richness was in uh, the middle Pliocene, basically around 3.6 to 3.3 million years. Uh, so includes things like, like Latoli, which is a rich fauna. Um, and uh, when we think about uh, sampling, and I will move on to the next slide, you can see, I mean, we, if we look at the number of localities sampled versus mean standing diversity, you can see that there's a strong correlation. So um, this obviously means that uh, these, uh, the data shown in this figure are um, biased by sampling. And uh, if we look closely at this sort of sampling, we can, we can basically see that uh, 
Well, I'll change the pointer to uh, to the laser thingy. Um, this trough uh, is too deep. Uh, there's poor sampling in this time range between 2.7 and 2.1 million than there is before and after. Um, because uh, here we have some rich sites and here we have some rich sites, uh, old of I and, and uh, much of Kubifora is in this time range. And here there's not a whole lot. Um, so this trough should be pushed up and this peak should be pushed down. And uh, essentially what we have, and you can see you can see a slight effect of this by not using raw counts, but using uh, mean standing richness. Um, so basically what we really have, and you will see this again, is uh, monotonously decreasing uh, diversity. Um, but if we look at, at turnover, uh, again, there are some peaks, uh, and again, this trough is too low um, and should probably and, and should be uh, a little higher. This peak should be a little lower. And what we basically see is is increasing extinction through time, uh, extinction rate through time until about a million years ago, uh, when there's nothing left to go extinct. If you want to put it that way. Uh, there's about the same number of species uh, around. Uh, a million years ago that there are today. Uh, so uh, the species that remain at this time about a million years ago are those uh, that, uh, that were, uh, have generalized enough adaptations to uh, survive uh, changing, changing times in terms of uh, both climate and environmental change and change in the, uh, in the com competitive regime. So um, to understand a little bit about uh, what follows, we need to look at uh, disparity. So this is a diagram of total carnivore disparity today uh, based on a um, a data set encompassing uh, craniodental measurement measures designed to measure uh, the ability to uh, to catch, kill, and eat prey. So uh, we can we can readily find the the major families here. We have felids way up here. We have canids up here. We have. Mustelids, which are a very large group, all these dark blue dots. And we have procyonids here. So um, what we're seeing here is on this axis, uh, axis one is uh, a gradient from hypo, hyper carnivores here. So carnivores that basically are specialized meat eaters um, and they include, aside from the felids, also um, Cryptoprocta, the fusa of, uh, of Madagascar, uh, and the spotted and brown hyenas. And over here, we have hypocarnivores. And the extreme of hypocarnivores are the procyonids, which are basic, most of which are either omnivores or frugivores. Uh, so they really don't eat much in the way of meat at all. And uh, then we have all the gradient in between of, of things that, you know, mustelas that ate a lot of meat, mustelas that ate almost no meat, uh, and so forth. Um, and on, on the second axis, the vertical axis, we have animals that have a full complement of, of premolars, like canids, long snouts with all of the premolars. And down here, we have animals that have reduced premolars like some mustelids and the bears, which are these gray things here. Bears are very strongly molar dominated. Um, so uh, these axes are interpretable and uh, can be used to look at uh, carnivore disparity in the past. And that's what we did. Uh, so uh, there are a number of steps in here and uh, 
but these are the end sort of the end members of uh, disparity in uh, in the large large carnivore guild. Remember, here we were looking at all carnivores. Now we've just extracted the large carnivores. Uh, the and and uh, so at three at, at peak carnivore richness, uh, this is what that metric looked like for African carnivores. So again, you have hyper carnivores here. We have lots of we have lots of felids and we have we have uh, um, hyenas. Uh, there were more hyper carnivorous hyenas then than there are now. Uh, and over here you have the hypo carnivores. Uh, we don't have any procyonids obviously in Africa, but bears and mustelids fall at this end and then we have uh, a couple of uh, things in between a large viverid and uh, and things like that so um, so that is uh, for the 3.5 to 3 million year uh, time bin and the, here we have what it looks like today when we got rid of all those pesky large carnivores um, so what we have here are uh, some large carnivores, uh, some very hyper carnivores, uh, three species of phalid and the spotted hyena. Then we have the striped hyena. And over here we have the uh, hunting dog or the African wild dog. So, and this yellow box here is this yellow box here. So you can see that it is a very small part of the original disparity uh, diversity or the disparity volume uh, of, uh, of the Pliocene. Uh, now, you should be aware that, that you know, there are only a few species outside of this box in, in, in the Pliocene. So these dots have a very large influence on the difference between these two uh, plots. Um, so, but uh, the important thing isn't really, you know, how many species there are in here, how, how important is any one dot to uh, this calculation, but the fact that this plot matches pretty well the plots you get if you do a plot of Asian large carnivores or European large carnivores or North American large carnivores. Uh, there's a lot, there tend to be numerous uh, hyper carnivores, some things in the middle. And in North America, there's quite a lot at this end because of the procyonids. Uh, so regardless of, of uh, the, the strength of this pattern, um, there's an important, difference between this pattern that we see in Africa today and the pattern we see on all other continents. We can put this in, in slightly different terms, just looking at numbers. Um, so here's a plot of functional richness, which is calculated as uh, the area of this uh, uh, convex hull at 3.5 to 3 million, it was, it was at its maximum. Uh, it reduced a little bit, but not much, and then took a, a fairly large step uh, in, the early, in, in the early Pleistocene, and then a big step to the modern. Uh, of course, the scale makes this look even more dramatic than it actually is, although it is pretty dramatic. Um, for comparison, to say that this is not a general pattern of, of diversity, uh, we can look here at, at small species. Um, and we would expect, we might expect, uh, depending on how we interpret this, that small species should follow this pattern or should, uh, or should increase uh, as they do because uh, of better sampling. So, but basically if we, if we take into account uh, sampling, um, we can say that small, spe small species richness and number of species basically flatlines 
uh, over the last three and a half million years. Now, uh, now we get to the, uh, the controversial bit. So uh, here we have um, a plot from a paper that I wrote with colleagues and published in uh, Ecology Letters last year. Um, and first, we've we just did some diagrams of temperature and precipitation and forest cover through time, mainly based on uh, on you know it's based on other people's work uh, uh, on uh, the Helsinki group and on on others for these. And the the lines here are lowest regressions. So uh, and and this last one is based on Teres Erling's work on uh, on for on on uh, isotopes and uh, forest cover. Uh, and uh, then we looked at, um, because, because I had an initial hypothesis that, that uh, um, large carnivores became uh, increasingly under um, stress because of the increasing um, ecological expansion of hominins in Africa over the last say three million years. Um, and uh, so we wanted to look at what would uh, carnivore extinction look like compared to a uh, brain volume in, increase in uh, African hominins and the, or in, in hominins in general. And this is, this is basically all the points that are available for us uh, in this regard. So, I mean, and we know of course, that there, there was a, a general increase in, in brain volume uh, over time in, in hominins in Africa and elsewhere. Um, so, and then we ran uh, a different analysis than previously for to look at extinction rates. This is, uh, this is analysis, an analysis done in the, uh, in the Bayesian program PyRate, um, which doesn't require uh, known uh, origination and extinction dates. Um, so again, for a small carnivores, um, extinction rate pre is pretty much flatlined throughout. Um, yes, they go extinct. They go extinct at a fairly, uh, a fairly uh, steady pace. So uh, nothing dramatic, at least in terms of statistics. Uh, we cannot see any, any uh, major changes through this time. Um, but the large carnivores uh, show a monotonously increasing extinction rate. Um, through time. Now we can basically, the bit after 1 million uh, basically just is just a, uh, a, a mirror of what went before. Uh, and, and for that reason, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, statistical bounds of this uh, become larger and larger because there is no new data. Uh, but in the crucial time period, say from three to uh, one million, yes, there is a there is a monotonously increasing uh, extinction rate. Uh, that, of course, matches the increasingly monot the monotonously increasing brain volume um, rate of uh, of hominins. So. Um, These are the data. What we can say is that there is there is no significant correlation between temperature and extinction rate or precipitation and extinction rate uh, during this time. That's not to say that these things did not have an influence, but they may have had an influence through secondary um, effects. Uh, if, for example, temperature and precipitation um, Increased the uh, behavioral repertoire or the uh, the uh, uh, environmental uh, the environmental envelope uh, of of hominins. Uh, yes, maybe they did have an influence. Well, forest cover is in fact correlated with with extinction rate, not very strongly, but it is, uh, and you can see. Basically, the uh, the S shape, the, the the sigmoid curve here, and there is a there is an indication of a sigmoid curve here. And yes, they they, they are correlated. So, so there is definitely a correlation between uh, 
the increasingly open habitats of, uh, of the late Pliocene and, and, and then Pleistocene and carnivore extinction rate, which is not entirely unexpected. And, uh, and of course, links very nicely to, uh, to the expansion of hominins into uh, open habitats as well. Um, so there's been a lot of, uh, of, of brouhaha, at least in my ears about this. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is not an obvious hypothesis. Uh, the obvious hypothesis is uh, that climate change did it for carnivores. Uh, the problem there being that Carnivores are not particularly sensitive, particularly large carnivores are not particularly sensitive to climatic change. Um, so there are points for, or points against this hypothesis that have been uh, presented uh, both verbally and, and in print. Uh, and there are some points for, so I'd like, I trying to summarize them here. Um, one of the points against hominin influence on carnivore extinctions is that hominin populations were small. Um, but of course, that is an assumption. We, have, we really don't know, and we won't really know until somebody comes up with a way to, um, to extract DNA from uh, African hominins, uh, and then you can calculate uh, um, population sizes. Uh, but it, I mean, yes, it's an assumption. It, it may be true, uh, but uh, but we don't really know. Um, and and I would, if I would place my bets, I would say that yes, hominin populations were small, but not as small as we generally think. Um, the competitive interface with carnivores was limited. Again, that's an assumption, uh, and and it was probably true uh, very early on, very early on. I mean, I'm sure that. Uh, the competitive interface between Australopithecus afarensis and carnivores was not huge. Um, but we're now, you know, we're seeing stone tools at 3.2 million in the Lomequian um, uh, techno complex. And uh, it is possible that they had some, in, that, that those tools were important in, in uh, com competition with, with carnivores. And when I say competition, I don't mean hunting. There is, you know, hunting is a, is a much later phenomenon than, than what got this sort of thing started. So, I mean, I wouldn't expect hunting to be a significant uh, or, uh, or direct hunting of carnivores in particular to be a significant until, until, until well into the, uh, the, you know, well past 1.5 million, so uh, uh, in the upper Acheulean, perhaps. Um, now, other things go extinct too. Yes, they do. Uh, lots of things go extinct all the time, and you know. But but the mechanism I find for for why things go extinct is not really well explored. It's, it's easy to say, oh, well, the climate changed, or or uh, uh, you know some some other thing happened and then they went extinct. But, but the, what that means on the ground to the individual um, species and specimens within them is really not very well explored. Although unfortunately we will probably have uh, a lot of chance to explore that in, in, in the, if climate change goes on as, uh, as we think it does right now. Um, finally, um, it is, Assume that small that early hominins were small, weak, and poorly adapted to compete with large carnivores. And again, competition. This may not be direct competition. It can be, you know, stealing carcasses or uh, getting to carcasses first um, through, um, you know, visual uh, cues from from vultures or or things like that. Um, and as for Small and weak. Well, yeah, maybe. Um, but we we need to remember that uh, chimpanzees have been observed to chase leopards off kills. So, if chimpanzees can do it, perhaps early hominins could as well. So, 
that they were poorly adapted to compete with large carnivores is an assumption. And uh, that may be true part of the time, but not, not through, uh, through the, you know, the, the first 2 million years necessarily, or 3 million years of hominin evolution. Now, um, points for such a hypothesis being possible is that large carnivores have no fallback foods. And that is basically true. They, they require meat to survive. Um, uh, whereas hominins, of course, had fallback foods. They didn't. They, they don't need meat. Uh, if meat was scarce, if there was a drought, and 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 uh, the ungulates, uh, ungulate populations shrank, um, hominin, hominins would do fine, but the large carnivores would starve. Uh, and that is, you know, basically what we see. Uh, if in in Africa today, if a rainy season uh, fails, uh, you see a lot of uh, a lot of, uh, of starving carnivores and failure of of, uh, of breeding and that sort of thing. So um, one can use this and one can use an analogy with the present to uh, to realize that that large carnivores uh, are living at the edge basically. Um, large carnivores are generally more extinction prone. Yes, that is, that is certainly true. Um, and that's been stem demonstrated in several different ways. One, of course, is, is what I just mentioned, that they are, that they are generally uh, susceptible to uh, failure of, of the prey populations. Uh, but it's also true that uh, in evolutionary terms, large carnivores, generally speaking, have nowhere to go. Uh, they are, their teeth are at, in, particularly for felids and also to some extent for hyenas, their teeth are at the limit of, uh, of what they can be. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a paper from 10 or 15 years back now by uh, Holiday and Steppen showing that uh, that uh, carnivores go extinct rather than re-evolve um, dental features that would allow them to uh, expand their uh, diets. Um, finally, competition among large carnivores in the Black Pleistocene was fiercer than previously per perceived. And that uh, is new data and apparently true based on these new data. So we will look at them very briefly. So first of all, uh, in Afri East Africa today, there are five species of large carnivores. Leopard, lion, cheetah, spotted hyena, and African wild dog. Um, I'm not counting the striped hyena here because the striped hyena uh, gets more than half of its uh, dietary requirements from, from vegetable matter. Uh, that has changed through time, but but currently it is it can be regarded as an omnivore. Um, between th two and three million years ago, uh, there were twelve species. There were uh, le lions, leopards, and cheetahs, although not necessarily the modern species. That is not entirely clear. Then we had uh, five species of saber tooths in this time period, including three species of dinophilus. Uh, we had three species of, of spotted hyenas, um, and then we had a, uh, a large carnivore, uh, a large canid xenocyon that uh, arguably is not related to uh, the hunting dog of today. So just looking at this list, you can realize that yes, there's, there, is a, uh, there was more competition and you would expect given this competition that, uh, there would be more niche separation between these species, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So here's, uh, here's data that are, are uh, uh, unpublished, but in review. Um, and you can see here, this, this is uh, Delta C13 values for uh, lion, leopard, and spotted hyena. We'll concentrate on the, on the, uh, on the feelers here because hyenas, would tend to eat what would tend to show the signal of whatever animal killed the animals that they eat. I mean, they, they, spotted hyenas and lions have very similar diets overall. 
Um, so you can see here that uh, that lions basically feed on um, grazers and mixed feeders that will be up in this range, whereas uh, leopards mainly feed on mixed feeders and browsers, which are down here. So there's a clear separation between these two. Now, if you look at uh, all of these uh, ply Pleistocene carnivores, so we have uh, Dinophilus here, Homotherium, and Megantherium. Um, although there's a limited, obviously, a limited number of specimens, each dot is a specimen um, it, uh, studied, all of them basically fall in the yes, I am eating grazers and mixed feeders group. Um, one might assume that if we had been able to sample leopards, which as I noted before, are rare in this time period, um, they would have been down here then as well, although we don't exactly know this, but, but it's an assumption. So there would, would have been one species feeding on, on browsers. Um, but uh, you take this, uh, and if you look over here at this hyena species, Crocuta eterono, um, this species has really no adaptations to uh, bone, bone, uh, bone cracking. And then we add uh, a second um, hyena genus Casmoporthetes, which was almost certainly given its, um, given its both dental and postcranial structure, an open habitat hunter. Uh, if we add Xenocyon, all canids are open habitat animals almost. Uh, and, and then we add uh, leopards and cheetahs as well to this mix. And we have a huge number of uh, contemporaneous uh, carnivores that all seem to be feeding on grazers and mixed feeders. So competition must have been really intense at this time period. And I should say that um, this result and for things like Megantarian uh, is really surprising because Megantarian by all other uh, measures such as, as limb proportions would be ex expected to be a closed habitat hunter, uh, you know, lurking in, the, lurking in, the, uh, in, uh, in among the trees uh, for uh, unsuspecting prey to, uh, to wander by. Um, now, obviously, they could have uh, they could have been hunting at the forest edge and run out at at prey in the open, but it's very difficult to see something like Megantarian white eye or any one of the Dinophila species as as uh, pursuit predators, even in the sense of of lions. Uh, they were much stockier, had shorter limbs, and uh, so overall, there's a lot that speaks for a lot of competition in this time period among the large carnivores and therefore also for a greater risk of extinction. Uh, so basically that's it. Uh, carnivores uh, in, uh, in the past are fascinating. They're quite different from carnivores in the present. Um, and if I'd had time, I would have talked a little bit about the Miocene, which is a different world entirely. But, uh, but I will stop here. And thank you for listening. And uh, there are a lot of people to thank. But I, I think I, I need particularly to thank Mivaliki, who, uh, without whom I would not be working in Africa at all. So thank you. Thank you, Lars. Very stimulating talk. Um, we have some questions for you. That's all right. I hope so. Yep. Um, I hope I can answer them. Can't guarantee it. Now, um, yeah, you started out uh, with with uh, the the carnivores as a, as a guild a bit deeper in time, and you mentioned now that uh, you you had not talked about much uh, about the Miocene. But let me just ask you a, a question or two about the Miocene precisely. And one is about the role of the hyenodonts that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, is that, would that have been a, a role equivalent to the 
carnivores that came later? And is there any sort of relay of uh, hyenodont decline in relation to, to the carnivora uh, becoming more diverse and abundant? Well, the, the, uh, the sort of received wisdom answer is that yes, uh, they were outcompeted by the car carnivora, but looking at the, uh, looking at the actual data and at, at, at uh, the changes, that is not necessarily true. Um, for example, there's been, uh, there's been a general feeling that, well, the, lar the latest hyenodonts were really, really large and sort of lumbering animals. Uh, but again, that's not true. Uh, the very latest ones were not, they were medium sized forms. So I would say we really don't understand the interplay between hyenodonts and carnivora and the Miocene and a lot more work is needed to, uh, to get, uh, get to grips with, with what the hyenodonts were doing that managed I mean, the, the last hyenodonts don't, don't go extinct until, until uh, in the latest Middle Miocene. So, uh, and they were present in Africa. They, they, they were present together with carnivora in East Africa from 20 million years ago. So that's a 10 million year time span during which they did survive. Uh, there were taxonomic changes. There were, you know, uh, and all that, but but we don't really we don't really know how niches were partitioned over, over this time, and I th I would suspect that some carnivore groups or carnivoran groups were suppressed by hyenodonts, and that's the reason why why they are not uh, as diverse as they became later. So you mentioned twenty million years uh, would. Would those be the earliest carnivora per se in Africa? And those no, there. I mean, there are there are now a couple of sites that are older than that with with carnivora. Um, um, but certainly, uh, carnivora, the first carnivora appeared in in Africa around the uh, Oligocene Miocene boundary. Um, before that, it was it was the playground of hyenodonts. But they, um, when you get up to uh, about 17 to 19 million, uh, there's quite a diversity of, of, uh, of carnivora. So they diversify, they did diversify fairly rapidly. And many, you know, many of those, some of those carnivora are things that uh, migrated from, from Eurasia, but many of them are actually um, recently evolved African forms. A question here from Yana. Uh, do we have an idea what functional richness looked like in large carnivores prior to the 3.5 uh, million year time interval? And was it already decreasing when, when that first time frame that you illustrate uh, started? I would say no, it wasn't. Uh, it was probably for, for large carnivores, uh, uh, functional richness was probably pretty high uh, from the uh, at least from the from the time when we have reasonable sampling, which is you know the last eight million years. Uh, I mean, we have we have excellent samples of uh, of carnivora from Taurus Manala and from from Lothigum and from a couple of other places, suggesting that uh, that uh, functional richness was was high uh, until relatively recently. Now, Lars, thinking in ecological terms, um, when you show the high diversity of the carnivore guild in, in the past, um, and we think about, yeah, and, and you show the slide of uh, uh, the, the stable isotopes and, and so on, um, is, are there effects of time averaging when we think about any particular site, let's say Laetoli, where you may have a certain diversity of, of carnivora? Uh, are there effects you think of of uh, time averaging and sampling that uh, that that may influence or may inflate perhaps the diversity that that we're seeing in in the fossil record? Is that an issue to to consider? Well, it's always an, you know time averaging is always an issue. Uh, but I would I think that yeah certainly there is there is some time averaging. Uh, 
of those the three species of, of dinophilus that you saw in the last diagram, they probably were not there at the same time, but two were, uh, I have no doubt. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, um, I would think that that large carnivores, given their large geographic ranges and uh, often substantial temporal ranges, uh, there is less time averaging in this group than than in in, in many uh, com many comparable mammal groups. But it's certain it, it is certainly there. There's no avoiding it. Uh, that's it's the curse of paleontology. And you did mention the bears. Um, yep. The bears, uh, very rare from what I understand. Very, very rare. Uh, any thoughts on, on, on their possible environments? Uh, is this rarity mostly related to their possible environmental preference, demographics? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Probably, yeah. I mean, bears, overall bears are, are closed habitat species. On the other hand, we should remember that you know the the place to look for at bear fossils in uh, in uh, Africa is Langebanweg, where they have a uh, this wonderful sample of Agriotherium africanum, uh, a huge bear, and uh, and a bear that is not uh, related to living bears. So, you know, we know less about what 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 this bear did than we would of. Uh, if, if it was an ursid bear like, like bears today. Um, certainly I think there is, uh, there's, we wouldn't expect to see bears in, in, a, in a very open habitat without much water like Latoli, for example. But uh, I mean, there is certainly is a variety of habitats represented uh, across the board. So, but I would expect to see bears in those times and habitats where it was a little bit wetter. So there was perhaps a little, uh, you know, if rivers were a little larger, gallery forests were more extended. Uh, but then of course we have the problem of, of fossil preservation. I mean, uh, they have to, they not only have to be there, they have to be preserved as well. So, and, and that, you know, the issue of preservation and habitat may be one of the reasons why we have so few lions and leopards prior to the Pleistocene, uh, because they were probably open habitat forms from the start, uh, at least the lions were, and uh, were outcompeted in the more closed habitats by saber tooths. Uh, I mean, this is speculative, obviously, but, and, and may have to be modified based on those isotope results, which I'm still trying to digest. I mean, I'm a co-author on that paper, so uh, so uh, I I'm I am stunned by by that result. I think it's 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 pretty amazing. So uh, there's much to be said about it. We we do have bears in Hadar, right? Which is not necessarily a very Closed environment, although there are certain elements of that. I don't think there is any bear at Hadar. Oh, okay. I think that's uh, there was bear at Kubifora. Okay. We have a couple of bear specimens at Kubifora. Uh, there's bear, there's at least one bear tooth in, uh, in the Tugan Hills. Uh, and uh, so they, they, were, they were around in places, particularly in Langebande, but. Uh, but to what extent, extent is hard to say. I would have, I mean, there was a recent paper came out in Gondwana Research by, uh, by the French team, you know, Otier et al, on, on a, uh, a faunal, Pleistocene faunal from Senegal, I believe, which is basically the fauna is, the fauna is an East African fauna. Uh, if I hadn't seen that, I would have said, well, the bears are probably, they're probably in towards the West and make brief excursions into the east, but uh, hey, maybe not. Now, coming to the the, the bone cracking carnivorans, uh, what is the timing then of their uh, appearance and evolution in, in in Africa? And could this this uh, evolutionary development have had an influence in the on the fossil record itself? 
No, that's very unlikely, at least uh, at least to begin with. Uh, the uh, um, hyenas in the broad sense, uh, including uh, the Percucutids, mm -hmm. which are uh, either a separate family altogether or an early offshoot of hyenity. Uh, there's still ongoing debate about. They appear in Africa at about the same time. So in the, uh, in the second half of the uh, Middle Miocene. Um, Percocuta is represented by Percocuta tabini, which is sort of a, a small version of, uh, of a, uh, a striped hyena of today. Uh, whereas the true hyenidae are only represented by, by some uh, small ichthyrs, uh, you know, small uh, canid-like forms in North Africa. Um, and it takes quite a long time uh, for hyenas to build up any sort of diversity in, 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 in Africa. And with the exception of, uh, of some adcrocuta specimens, it's a Eurasian, uh, a Eurasian form with, of bone, with bone cracking, cracking capabilities, uh, all the hyenas in Africa until uh, the end of the Miocene were canid avatars, uh, which is what canids basically were before the canids, what hyenas basically were before the canids showed up from North America. Um, so, uh, and so they were not bone collectors, not scavengers, uh, and uh, so probably would not in, at least in the Miocene have any, any appreciable effect on, on the fossil record. Um, and even in, uh, when you get into the Pliocene, uh, the earliest Kukuta is, is uh, from uh, the lower Latobi beds at 4 million. So there's, you know, they still have a waste another million years before, uh, before the, modern, the modern forms show up. Uh, and uh, you know, by then it looks like you know the fauna is pretty well established. So I I don't think they may have had an effect. They they would have had an effect on on the fauna, for example, at at Canapoy. Uh, most of the bones at Canapoy are are hyena gnawed, particularly uh, the uh, the uh, anamensis. Uh, so uh, and so wherever you clearly have hyena dens. Like at Canopy, well, yes, obviously they have an they they have an effect on on what you find. Um, so, but uh, but overall, it's it's not until late in the game that they would be would be influential in that respect. Now, for the uh, for the arguments uh, that you pose in terms of the the, the, the possible correlation and, and causation with regard to uh, hominins and. Um, in carnivore diversity. We have a question here, uh, Ben Knighton. How carnivorous were hominins in the African Pleistocene? Ply I mean, this would be one of the key yeah. issues, right? Well, obviously this is, a, this is not something we can know with certainty, at least not yet. Uh, although of course, uh, some knowledge is, is available from isotopes. Um, but I mean, if we look at chimpanzees, uh, they include somewhere between two and five percent meat in their diet, uh, and uh, not not primarily for nutritional purposes. But but uh, you know, there's this, there's a lot of food sharing and all that sort of thing going on there. So that that is probably more important than the actual uh, nutrition. But there's no reason to to expect that that early hominins necessarily ate less meat than that, and uh, you know, and we haven't, you know, we apart from you know large prey or large uh, let's put let's say large packages of meat like ungulates or, or like, you know we have all the all the rodents and and you know the smaller animals that that they could probably you know pick up and, or. or catch and, and, and eat. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're at uh, the origin of Australopithecus, I would expect, you know, again, some, you know, three, four or 5% meat, but um, clearly that has increased over time. Uh, and I, you know, without, without having any 
specific knowledge, I would say that that you know, come Homo erectus time, uh, I would expect there's to be 10% meat in the diet. I mean, they, they certainly had the tools uh, to do with them, or perhaps the first hominins to actually be capable of, 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 of hunting and, and, and competing with carnivores in that respect. Um, but, you know, I mean, these hominins were not stupid. Uh, and uh, if, there was, if there was meat lying around in the, habit, in the environment and they could get at it, why wouldn't they? It, 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 um, it would be, you know, easy pickings if, if there weren't a couple of lions there. Or, uh, and, the, and like I said, you know, chimpanzees have been observed chasing leopards off prey. Uh, not necessarily to get at the prey, but to get rid of the leopard. But, uh, but they are capable of it. And, and there's every indication you know, from, you know, from shoulder morphology and, and all that sort of thing that, that early hominins were, would have been better at throwing stones or whatever at, at, uh, at carnivores to, to make them go away. And certainly they, they probably appeared in larger groups than, than, than chimpanzees would have as well. So uh, they had the capability uh, and uh, I think the point is that it would take much less than you think uh, to push some of those carnivores over the edge to extinction because they're already living. At, you know, just look at any any uh, TV documentary of like the life of a lot, the year of a lion, that sort of thing. I mean, they are really they are really stressed in the dry season. And if, uh, you know, if, uh, if rain doesn't come, they're in trouble. And, you know, you could have, we could have had, I mean, certainly that, I mean, that's, that's an environmental effect. That's a climate effect. Um, but, uh, but they are, and, but if you add the, the added competition back in the day, uh, then not much meat stealing would have to go on for, go to happen for for uh, some carnivore species, uh, perhaps that, you know something like Megantarian, which uh, which was probably a marginal member of the community in any case. To uh, to for their population sizes to drop to the level where they were not sustainable anymore. We, you know, look at look at cheetahs and the uh, and the population bottlenecks they have had, and they are they could. They would serve nicely as the model for this sort of thing. I mean, they are really, uh, they are really on the brink all the time, so to speak, because of their because of their uh, uh, hunting mode and because of their their prey spectrum and all those sort of things. That uh, and uh, and they are, you know, I I usually say that uh, that. You know, cheetahs should be extinct. They just got lucky to survive. And uh, Lars, you showed a very nice diagram of uh, brain size in hominins and uh, yep. the kind of, uh, of diversity in the carnivora. Um, are there some other measures that would be uh, perhaps uh, more, a more direct uh, effect of, uh, in terms of com competition with the, the carnivora, such as um, uh, density of archaeological sites or different types of stone tools. Certainly, yeah. Or perhaps I was uh, yeah. Tools I mean, associated with uh, with fauna remains that show cut marks and yeah. I mean, I, I yes, definitely. I, I completely agree that there would be. Uh, however, uh, none of us has sufficient. None of neither I nor my co-authors had sufficient access to the to to that literature to be able to uh, to. To be able to uh, use use those data which are out there in any meaningful way. So I mean, there's work to be done there, but uh, but uh, it you know, given that the uh, the archaeological literature is very disparate and, and sometimes can be hard to access by uh, you know non archaeologists. It's it, it's a big it would be a big job to to get at that. But yes, I mean certainly there uh, there uh, there is a huge literature obviously on you know 
uh, on uh, you know the relationship of bones to hominins to carnivores. Uh, you know, were carnivores there first? Were homin were hominins there first? In what order? How many times? All those sorts. Of, I mean, that's that's been uh, an, an enormous amount of work has been done on that, but. Uh, but the literature is very scattered, and uh, and one would have to, you know, in order to be able to use that, one would have to get at a, you know, a, you know, a significant sample, and and it's you know it's not easy to do. So we use the quick and dirty method. Well, very good. I think uh, we, we might need to get uh, some some of our archaeology archaeology colleagues to uh, perhaps think about this. Yeah, I mean that's, that's you know, that would that would be great if if, if somebody is interested in, in 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 looking into those sorts of patterns. Yeah, um, I'm just raising the question. Yeah, you know, is this possible? Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, basically because I'm uh, I'm a little bit annoyed that with a stock answer that well, climate is responsible for everything. So uh, so I like to you know it's cat among the pigeons. Mm -hmm. Now, the decline in the diversity of carnivores, uh, is it associated, you think, at all with uh, the decline in megafauna in Africa during much of this time? Are these well, the timing is different. Phenomena or? The timing is different. Um, I mean, you would expect, uh, you would expect uh, if the prey species, if you know there's extinction, if if the if the extinction of the prey species were responsible for the extinction of the of, of the carnivores, you would expect the prey species to go extinct first. But by all measures that I have, uh, the carnivore extinctions precede the ungulate extinctions. So. Uh, that is one of the things that suggests to me that it is not, it's not the prey per se that is, uh, that is responsible. Um, unless we do, one could argue that in, in several ways, but, but that's the prima facie evidence is that the carnivores, the carnivores went extinct independently of, of, uh, of extinctions of the megafauna. I was thinking more in, in terms of possible drivers rather than, than the declining megafauna uh, being responsible for the decline in the carnivore diversity, but perhaps, I mean, there has been some discussion too about hominins uh, also driving um, megafaunal declines over yeah. time. Well, certainly that has happened in, on the, you know, North America. Uh, that's, you know, the, that hominins certainly had an influence there. Uh, but that is a di completely different scenario and, uh, you know, completely different environments, completely different animals and a completely different hominin. I mean, they were us. So uh, they had they had a whole different set of tools. Uh, and uh, so that's I, I, I have to say, I'm, I've been looking looking at patterns in Europe. This is not published yet, but and there doesn't seem to be any marked decline of carnivores when hominins appear in, in, in Europe. But uh, I believe that is that has to do with the difference in how Europe was mainly forested when hominins appeared, whereas Africa was open habitat. And I think open habitat is a key uh, because open habitats would lead to much more confrontation and competition than, than forests would, where, you know, you can you can walk a long time in a forest without seeing a carnivore. So uh, so habitat does play a role. There's you know there's no getting around it, and you know whether or not that habitat uh, that crucial habitat is uh, related to uh, climate change or not is 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 hard to tell. I mean that that uh, that is basically the reason why. We have a correlation with with forest cover, with shade, uh, so that uh, the amount of shade is important. Um, so, so that is a prerequisite. And I think 
for one, you know, one of the reasons why that is the true is true is that for for carnivores to scavenge successfully, early, you know, for early hominins to scavenge successfully from 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 uh, carnivores or from dead from dead, uh, they would have to be able to use visual cues to see where there's a well, like vultures circling over overhead of buzzards, uh, to see, oh, there's something, there's something juicy over there. Let's go there. Uh, I mean, that, that, uh, that's a known phenomenon. So, uh, but that, that I, I think is, is a prerequisite. So it had, the habitat has to be open before, uh, before. And I think that, that may be what, you know, speeds up the decline in carnivores uh, at, after about 3 million. That and, and tools. We have a last question, uh, Lars, before we let you go. Uh, how, given that many of these uh, carnivores are relatively rare, you know, the, the, the bears are one example, but um, you mentioned the, the Anhydridon tikika, which I think we all, only have a few specimens. Uh, oh, Anhydridon is not rare. But, but the species. Tikika. The species, yes, but uh, yeah. Given that some of these stocks are quite rare, how confident uh, can we be in the overall macroevolutionary patterns that, that you're showing with regard to speciation and extinctions and the timing of these uh, uh, extinctions? Yeah, I think, I, I think overall, from uh, from the the experience I've had over the last twenty five years, uh, we can be reasonably confident. Uh, I think the pattern is uh, we can never know if the pattern is true, but the pattern is certainly stable. So uh, there aren't really any any sites that fall outside the pattern and, and, and uh, I mean, if you, the, the carnivores of, of Hadar are not published, but that's something that, that we're working on and uh, it falls nicely with the pattern that we already have. Uh, there are some differences uh, that are clearly identifiable. Latolia is, is more open than any of the other habitats. Uh, so there is a slightly different complement of carnivores. And that's you know that's why we have these Panthera C F Leo and, and, and those sorts. Of things. But um, for for a long time, Latoli was the only site that early that had lions or whatever those animals are, uh, proto lions. Um, but there certainly you know there were certainly also lions at Ronzamile. So uh, so you know the it, it is a, it is a stable pattern. Uh, and I think that uh, there are, yes, there are certain taxa that, uh, that are rare, uh, but uh, those are the exceptions. I mean, if I, could, if, I could, if I could tell you how many spotted hyena specimens we have, it's, you know, it's, they are everywhere. Uh, and the saber tooths are everywhere. And, uh, and you know, even in hydrodon, although not necessarily that species, they seem to have speciated very rapidly. Um, uh, certainly in hydrodon is found at pretty much all sites prior to two and a half million. So uh, we see those traces. So I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that the pattern will not change significantly uh, regardless of, of how much more material we get. Well, thank you, Lars. I think that's all we, we have for now. And um, we really appreciate you taking the time to give us this uh, very interesting talk and uh, answer uh, our questions. So thank you so much. Uh, this is the last uh, primate conversations of this term. So you're closing the series for the term and for the year. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to continuing with primate conversations next term uh, after the new year. So thank you so much, so much, Lars. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.